All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great privilege to introduce uh, Andrew Zengel. Um, he's a professor at Georgia Tech. Um, and Andrew uh, graduated with a PhD uh, from University of Pennsylvania. Um, after a short stint as a postdoc at Brookhaven, um, he ended up being a uh, faculty at Georgia Tech, where he's been since. Um, he's been awarded uh, a fellowship from the American, Phil uh, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society. And Georgia Tech, um, I think in 2017, uh, Andrew, you've got an award for being an outstanding teacher. Um, Andrew is a condensed matter physicist and he's a surface physicist. Um, has been doing it for many years. Um, today's colloquium is an exception in a sense that Andrew is not deliberately going to talk about his research. And that's not because that's not outstanding, but because I specifically ask him not to. I ask him instead to speak about the upcoming biography of uh, P.W. Anderson, which is going to appear to be in January. Um, and Andrew has graciously agreed to give this talk. Um, and um, probably without further ado, I'll, 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 I'll let uh, this, the short introduction um, to close. And Andrew, please, um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. So let us uh, try sharing the screen. Well, of course, it worked when we tested it, didn't it? There we go. OK, good. Um, so um, we uh, earlier this year, we lost uh, one of the, the great physicists of this century, um, just in March, as you can see there on the left. Phil Anderson um, has a, can stake a claim, I think, to be one of the perhaps the most um, influential and productive physicists of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, there's a tiny handful of people who may compete for that um, honor. And what I'd like to do today is to try to give you some sense of why, uh, why that is, um, and uh, some sense of the scope, not only of his uh, scientific career, but also of his life, because um, he didn't confine his activities just uh, to, to doing physics. Um, some of you already know some of his uh, forays into uh, science politics, and we'll get into uh, some of that as well. Um, so uh, let's see, let's see, let me see, there we go. So in order to, uh, you know, qualify for a biography, at least as a physicist, uh, it's probably necessary to have won a Nobel Prize. And so in the the case of Anderson, uh, that happened in 1977. Um, and you can see him there on the left. And the citation that uh, every laureate uh, receives uh, for their work, in his case, it was for fundamental theoretical investigations of the electronic structure of magnetic and disordered systems, um, which, which tells you almost nothing uh, about what, uh, what Phil really did and what his influence was. Um, there's various ways that we could imagine trying to, to quantify that. Um, one of them would be statistics. So here are some statistics. Uh, he wrote about 500 uh, technical articles in the, in the course of his career. Uh, interestingly, 60% of them were single author, which even for someone of his age, and he was born in 1923, um, is, is pretty unusual. Uh, 55 book reviews, most of them written in the last uh, 20 years uh, of his life. Uh, as, in, as someone in, engaged in, in, in public affairs, as he was, he actually wrote 30 letters uh, to the editor of various newspapers and, and published op-ed pieces in places like the New York Times and The Guardian. He actually is, uh, has three patents. And um, the H-index, the ever popular H-index, it turns out for him is, uh, is 91. And besides the Nobel Prize, um, he also won a great many other uh, awards and honorary degrees and all sorts of things like that. Um, now, again, just statistics, we don't get some sense of, of the scope uh, and the breadth of his work. Um, and so one way to get at that is to look at this graph here, which is quite, I had fun putting this together. This is so you can see this span of his career. He got his PhD in 1949 for, um, problem on the quantum theory of spectral line broadening, which we'll talk about. And these things are all arranged more or less all the way up into the 2000s, where he was working on 
uh, so-called supersolids and uh, wrote a book called The Theory of High Temperature Superconductivity and the Cuprates. Um, by the way, in the original uh, book, uh, the word the isn't, right in this, isn't written this way. It's written uh, capital T, capital H, capital E, uh, which all, already gives you some sense of his personality. If you just sort of glance through this picture, you see all these various topics, which is uh, an amazingly broad range of things from uh, what was called solid state physics when he started in 1950, um, and to a very great degree due to his own work, transformed into the field which we today call condensed matter physics. And I'll try to argue that this is not just uh, a cosmetic name change. And we can see all sorts of things. There's ferroelectricity, there's superconductivity, antiferromagnetism, helium-3, helium-4, the Josephson effect, here's the Higgs mechanism, which we'll get to, the Kondo effect, all these things. A great many of these fall into what we call many body physics, or in his case, the many electron problem. Um, and in, in, in many, many of these, he actually opened the field, wrote the first imp uh, important paper, and then many other people um, flowed in and worked on them subsequently. But it really is quite remarkable um, how he managed to remain uh, productive essentially over this entire 50-year uh, period, which I think is quite, quite remarkable. I would take all of my time to even spend a sentence or two on every single thing written here, and so I won't do that. I'll just pick out um, a few of the highlights uh, and tell you a little bit about the backstory of, of some of those um, as, we, as we proceed. Uh, so where does this story actually um, begin? It begins in Indiana, uh, where he was born. And this is in fact um, a picture taken, so he was born in 23, so this is a picture taken in 1934 um, on the family farm. Um, one part of his family uh, were, were farmers and remained farmers, actually a, a whole set of aunts and uncles who were farmers. Um, so on the other hand, the other half of the family uh, were in fact academics and lawyers as well. So there's this interesting uh, split between these two. Here's Phil right in the middle, his sister a little bit older right there, his mother right behind him, and his father, uh, Harry, standing right there. Um, now it's important because of the timing here, we're talking about right in the middle of the Great Depression. And so often for folks of his age, there's a, there's a story about you know, the privation uh, during the Great Depression and how that molded character and all sorts of things of that kind. Turns out they're not really relevant in Phil's case. Um, so Harry Anderson uh, was a professor at the University of Illinois in uh, Urbana-Champaign. And that's in fact where Phil grew up. Uh, not in Indiana, but although he traveled, the distance between Crawfordsville, Indiana and, and uh, Urbana-Champaign is, is very short, and they went back and forth um, all the time. But my point is, is that as a professor um, at the university, um, Harry did not suffer very much during the Depression. He had about a 15% pay cut for a couple of years, and that was typical of the professoriate all across the United States. Um, university professors did not suffer greatly during the Depression, and that was the case with Phil as well. He didn't have to have a job to help support the family, didn't even have to have a summer job uh, at all. And so that he led really quite a privileged, I would say, for someone who grew up in the Depression, quite a privileged childhood. He uh, attended uh, high school. Another example of that privilege um, is uh, this place, which is the University of Illinois uh, Laboratory High School, there are a number of universities around the country who have similar institutions. These are schools which are built and managed by a university for the purpose of providing a place for their College of Education students to, well, work on their skills. And so as it was a private school, you had to pay to attend. Um, and so again, only people who could afford, although it's, it wasn't the tuition was quite low, but nevertheless, you did have to pay. And so most of the students who were at the school were either the children of University of Illinois faculty or of businessmen in the Champaign-Urbana area. Uh, Phil was an outstanding student uh, in high school. Um, his physics teacher, who you might well imagine would be an important character in his story, was this gentleman here, Wilbur Harnish. Um, as it happens, Harnish had no training in physics whatsoever all of his education was in education, as a matter of fact, and they needed someone to teach physics, and he was 
pretty much simply uh, thrust into the job. Uh, not really knowing the subject very well, it, the class amounted to um, a laboratory class where Harnish would simply put equipment in front of the students and have them play around with it. And so, you know, electric motors and, and blocks sliding down planes and, and pumps and all sorts of things. But um, he didn't really talk about the principles of physics, which guided the various phenomena that the students were studying. And so as one of the Phil's classmates told me when I asked him, that almost everybody who exited a Harnish's class had a dislike for physics when they left. So in fact, Phil had planned and did become um, a math major when he went off to college. Uh, where did he go off to college? He went to Harvard. And that was because his father, being a professor at the university, was quite good friends with the chairman of the physics department, um, a gentleman named Loomis, and who had been to Harvard. And he encouraged Phil to uh, uh, not only apply, but to apply for a scholarship, which um, allowed him to go, uh, as Harvard was the most expensive university in the uh, country at that time. And so, okay, here's John Harvard um, on the campus. You can see here that these are the times when um, Anderson was a student. It's only three years. And in fact, everybody who entered in 1940 graduated in three years because uh, World War II, of course, uh, broke out in the middle. And so Harvard was um, trying to get all of the technically trained students that they had uh, to be graduated so that they could can contribute to the war effort. One of the ways they did that um, was that they took their physics major and already by his second year, um, Phil had switched from math to physics because the first year freshman physics class really um, turned him on. Um, Harvard invented a new major called electronic physics, which if you look at the curriculum was basically radar engineering. And so Harvard decided to teach all their the physics majors who agreed to switch to this major uh, radar engineering so they could immediately upon graduation be plugged into one of the uh, facilities around the country that was working on that. So that's in fact what happened. Phil decided to switch into this major and that is what he did. Uh, one of his classmates who did exactly the same thing, a physics major who switched to electronic physics was this gentleman, Thomas Kuhn. And this name uh, may be known to some of you because um, very soon, actually Kuhn went on and got a PhD in physics um, also, but he immediately then switched to the history and philosophy of physics. And he wrote a perhaps the most famous book um, in 20th century uh, history and philosophy of physics, namely the structure of scientific revolutions. So that is the same Thomas Kuhn and the um, Kuhn and Anderson were actually rivals at getting the highest grades when they were at Harvard. He, in fact, Phil, in fact, got straight A's and so did Kuhn. Um, now, so as I said, when they got his degree, um, the students who didn't switch and remained in, in physics actually were all shipped off to Los Alamos, even though they didn't know what was going to be going on there because it was a great secret. And uh, Phil went to one of the radar facilities and the one that he was sent to was the Naval Research Lab in Washington, DC. And in particular, he was assigned to a group um, that was building um, antenna, uh, and these are all uh, in the microwave uh, regime, antenna for radar countermeasures. And so what that means is these are the types of projects that they were working on were dictated by events that were really going on in the war. So for example, at a certain point, um, the Luftwaffe uh, introduced a type of radio controlled bomb, which would be dropped from an airplane, which would stay safely out of anti-aircraft range and it would guide the bomb down to its target and they introduced this in the Mediterranean and wreaked havoc until um, technicians from the NRL um, managed to determine the frequency that they were using and then Phil's group was in charge of designing an antenna to put on a ship in order to try to jam that uh, signal and in fact Phil's first um, technical paper was in fact the paper his group wrote about that particular piece of countermeasure. Uh, the time spent at the NR at NRL, which was a couple of years, as you can see here, from it wasn't wasted from a physics point of view, because uh, another uh, older scientist at the lab uh, gave Phil a copy of this book, The Mathematics of Physics and Chemistry by Marginal and Murphy. It was a brand new book at that time. Uh, it's really a nice book. I, I happen to own a copy myself. And uh, Phil, either it res the um, introduction to it either resonated with him or when he read this following sentence, he adopted it as a mantra, 
Namely, as it says here, the successful pioneer depends more on brilliant hunches than on the results of existence theorems. And um, this is something that a, a characteristic that Anderson um, showed through his entire career. He really had little truck for mathematical physics and, and, and formal mathematics. Um, his, um, always his interest was to guess his way to the answer and then provide whatever mathematics was necessary in order to convince people um, that he was right. And so this is really um, quite, quite prescient um, for, the, uh, for the, the budding uh, physicist Anderson. So he, uh, he completes his war service um, and he then decides he wants to be a professional physicist. So got to go to graduate school for that. And the question is where to go. And at that time, even though the, uh, it was still you know, not widely known what it was going on at Los Alamos, it was well known within the physics community that the hot topic um, in the middle 40s was nuclear physics. That was the new fascinating subject. And there were a number of places that were already renowned for doing that kind of work. Uh, Columbia, Michigan, Berkeley, for example. Um, Phil would have none of that. Um, he decided he was going to go back to Harvard to get his PhD, even though there really wasn't, certainly from the experimental point of view, there was little or no um, cutting edge nuclear physics being done there. Uh, and that's because the electronic physics degree that he had taken that I mentioned, this radar engineering class was entirely 19th century physics. It was all classical physics. Not a single class that he took had even the word quantum in it. And he felt that Harvard had robbed him of a modern physics uh, degree. And so he was going to go back to uh, Harvard and get it. And so that's exactly what he did. He went back to get his PhD at Harvard. And these are the years that he spent uh, there, a great deal of it spent in the uh, Jefferson Laboratory. Um, so I'll talk about his, his thesis problem in just a second, which, which in fact was not in nuclear physics. But um, I want to just indicate that when he was there, he didn't hang out with the other um, physics students. In fact, as a social life, and he was a bit of a shy and retiring fellow anyway at this time in his life, believe it or not. And uh, he hung out uh, with a group of students who were in other, other areas of, uh, of Harvard in the social sciences, the humanities, also math students, chemistry students. And one of them was this gentleman here, Tom Lehrer. Now, um, if you're of a certain age, namely my age, uh, you know who this is, and not only that, you can probably sing all of the satirical songs that Lehrer wrote and then performed on the piano and then wrote, uh, made a number of record albums, uh, which sold tremendously well um, at, at this time period or a few years after. And so Lehrer was a very young man at that time, and he started uh, playing for the amusement of his friends, Anderson being one of them and uh, later really became internationally well known. If you do not know this name, I urge you, you younger folks, to Google uh, Lehrer and look at the web pages devoted to his songs and listen to them, because many of them are absolutely relevant today. Many of them deal with social justice issues. Um, when he was singing about them in the, in the 50s, they're just as relevant, um, what is it, 70 years later. Uh, and they remain friends their entire lives, uh, Anderson and, and Lehrer. Now, academics. Um, at Harvard, um, the big theoretical um, gun and at NRL, Phil learned that he was not going to be an experimentalist. Um, he didn't have any hands and he was given jobs like soldering microwave plumbing together um, and he realized that theoretical physics was likely to be his future. And uh, the semester before Anderson arrived at Harvard, Schwinger arrived there because Harvard won in a bidding war with Berkeley and Columbia um, to get him. Uh, he was the wunderkind, uh, the uh, superstar. And in fact, there were 11 other students who entered um, Harvard at the same time as Anderson did, and they all chose to work with Schwinger, and he took all of them as students. And there were only two students um, who wanted to do theory who did not choose, did not choose to work with Schwinger, and one of them was uh, Thomas Kuhn, and the other one was Phil Anderson, and they both wound up working for this gentleman, John Van Vleck, who was the chairman of the Harvard Physics Department at the time. And uh, Van Vleck had made his name uh, doing what we would call perhaps chemical physics. Uh, he wrote a famous book 
on the theory of the electric and magnetic susceptibilities of atoms and molecules. In fact, his PhD thesis um, was the first in the United States to use the then new quantum mechanics. Um, but by the time uh, we're talking about here, which is the mid 40s, uh, he has shifted his interest in electric and magnetic phenomena to solids. And in particular, um, the data which was being acquired by his experimental colleagues who took the radar technology that had been developed during the war and was now using it for spectroscopy. Before the war, there was no experimental data in the microwave portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And after the war, suddenly there was. And so um, one of the mantras that John Van Vleck had was to follow the data um, and let your problems, your physics problems be defined by what the experimentalists are, are, are discovering. And this is something that Anderson um, absolutely lapped up and is characteristic of his career also. He's, he was never interested in constructing formal theories and then trying to convince someone to do an experiment. He would be interested in what, what experiment had the experimentalists jazzed at that moment, and then what could he do um, to, to help understand that, particularly if it represented what he called an anomaly or something that didn't fit into the current type of understanding. The particular problem that Van Vleck set for his new PhD student, Phil Anderson, uh, was to understand this spectrum. This is the um, absorption spectrum in the microwave right around one centimeter of the ammonia molecule or the ammonia gas actually. Um, and all of these peaks um, were understood at that time. In other words, the physical process was known that was responsible for these peaks. What was not understood was their widths. And so what um, Anderson's PhD thesis was about was making a fully quantum mechanical theory of the absorption spectrum, taking into account in that theory the collisions that ammonia molecules in the gas phase would have with each other. It was those collisions which were responsible for these widths. And it was through those collisions were at that time the only way you could learn about the intermolecular forces, the forces that different that ammonia molecules exert on each other. So the analysis of these spectra, that's what they were used for. And in fact, that's exactly what Anderson did. He made such a theory. It's quite a sophisticated PhD thesis actually, he uses quantum scattering theory in a non-trivial way. Um, and he predicted the widths of every one of these lines. And most of them were in quite reasonable agreement with experiment within 10% or so, but two of them were not. Two of them were quite different than the measurements. And the young um, Anderson in his thesis says that on the basis of his calculations, he suggests there must be some kind of experimental error with those two line widths um, because all the other ones were right and why would it, these two be wrong? And in fact, several years later when the experiment was redone, it was discovered that he was right, um, that his calculated line widths were correct across the board. So um, by this time, uh, during graduate school, Phil had gone back to Urbana for a, a, uh, just a, a quick trip to visit his family. And as it happened, uh, he met the woman who very soon thereafter became his wife. Um, and she came back and, and stayed with him at, uh, in Boston. They had a child quite quickly. And so by the time that he graduated, he already had a young family. And so he needed to look for a job. Um, and uh, for, for reasons which aren't clear, he uh, thought that uh, postdoc jobs were not gonna go to anyone who had a family. I don't know why he thought that, but uh, he only looked for either uh, industrial jobs, which he um, preferred or academic jobs. And uh, he really got very little interest because most of the um, uh, graduates, the hot topic, as I said, was nuclear physics. And this did not apparently appeal too much to very many uh, possible employers. He got a job offer from Westinghouse. Um, unfortunately there, the job would have been to reverse engineer the transistor that had just been invented by Bell Labs. And he didn't think it was a good idea working um, at one company to reverse engineer work done by another. But Bell Labs hadn't shown any interest. They wouldn't interview him. And so he wound up with a job offer from Washington State College, which is in Pullman, Washington. And he was about to go, um, even though it has no graduate program. Van Vleck asked him uh, where he was going. And uh, Anderson told him. And Van Vleck asked if that's where he wanted to go. And 
Anderson said, no, I'd rather go to Bell Labs. And, um, but they wouldn't interview me. Well, it always pays to uh, work for the right people. That's true today. It was true then. Uh, as it happened that Van Vleck was, uh, was a consultant to Bell Labs. So he put in a call and uh, his student got an interview. And as a result, um, he wound up working there. And so um, Anderson began working at Bell Labs in 1949. And he had a long successful career at Bell Labs. And as a matter of fact, it was, I would say that the glory years of Bell Labs where it was possibly the greatest industrial research laboratory, perhaps the greatest research laboratory in the world coincided with the time when Anderson was there. Uh, quite a remarkable thing. Um, that person who Van Vleck had called was this gentleman, William Shockley, who at the time was the co-head of the Salt State Physics Group um, at Bell. And it was he who interviewed um, Anderson and gave him a job. Um, and in fact, Shockley was interested in hiring a, a young theoretician because he wanted to understand ferroelectricity, uh, which was uh, ferroelectric crystals were being touted as, as possibly valuable in Bell's communication um, uh, devices because it's piezoelectric. Um, and they had a falling out over this because Shockley wanted uh, Anderson to approximately solve the Schrodinger equation to, to try to test some of his ideas on why ferroelectrics behave the way they do. And Anderson felt that you the techniques weren't available to solve the Schrodinger equation for something like a barium titanate crystal, which is a typical ferroelectric. And he thought one should use other simpler arguments. And so right away, um, he got into a, a, a dispute with his boss, which is never a good idea. But it turned out that Anderson's ideas were right. And he went to Shockley's co-head of the solid state physics group, who was a solid state chemist. And uh, he th was found Anderson's arguments very simpatico and very uh, convincing. And so uh, even though Shockley tried to have him fired um, right at that moment, uh, he didn't succeed because his co-head would not allow it. What it did mean, however, is that uh, Anderson needed new mentors. And let's not forget, his PhD was not in solid state physics. It was in this sort of chemical physics. So he had to learn the subject on the fly. And um, luckily for him, probably there was nowhere in the world at that moment where there was a greater concentration of theoretical solid state physics knowledge um, than you know, within 50 feet of his office at Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. In particular, Gregory Vanier, Conyers Herring, and Charlie Cattell um, became his mentors, Vanier principally with um, statistical mechanics, Cattell with magnetism, and Conyers Herring with general uh, solid state physics. Um, each of these gentlemen was about 10 years older than Anderson at the time. And each one of them played sort of a father figure role um, from an instructional point of view, just uh, an incredibly um, happy accident that they were present when uh, Anderson arrived. Uh, the problem that he started with was suggested by Cattell and it was a sort of an exotic problem in magnetism. Uh, and here's the, the title of the paper, an approximate quantum theory of the antiferromagnetic ground state. All right, now I'll tell you what an antiferromagnet is in just a second, but, um, and it, it certainly dealt with some problems which were of interest to people at the time because neutron scattering was a brand new technique at this time uh, to be able to study the spin structure of, uh, of crystals. And so the uh, motivation for this work was really to understand data um, taken at, at a reactor for a neutron scatter, magnetic neutron scattering. Uh, and the first part of the paper uh, talks about all of that. It's the second part of the paper that many people I think wouldn't have written at all. Uh, Anderson became fascinated with the fact that the um, uh, Hamiltonian that, that he wrote down here, um, uh, had rotational symmetry in spin space, but the solution uh, did not. And that phenomena today is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And although that word, he didn't use that word, he clearly understood the phenomena and clearly understood all of its implications because they're all written in this paper written in 1952. None of it was appreciated for over a decade. This paper was occasionally referenced for the other stuff about the uh, antiferromagnet but the, this aspect of it didn't catch on for quite a while. In particular, 
what do we mean? What did he understand about this phenomena? So here's what an antiferromagnet is. It's a type of a crystal um, where you have, these are electron spins, where there's an ordered state where um, there's a sublattice of the spins, which all point in the same direction like the red ones. And then there's an interpenetrating sublattice where another subset of electrons, their spins point in exactly the opposite direction. So this is a typical um, antiferromagnetic ordered state. If this were a ferromagnet, then all of these arrows would be pointing in exactly the same direction. So um, what I mentioned a minute ago is that the Hamiltonian had rotational symmetry, but the solution did not. In other words, all the spins pointed in one particular direction or along one particular line as shown here, right? So if you were to have a truly rotationally symmetric ground state, you would need to have a wave function which say it was to be a superposition of this one say, and this one, and this one, and all the ones in between, because only a wave function of that kind would have the proper rotational symmetry. What, um, but experimentally, this broken symmetry configuration is what was seen, um, but it seemed to violate the quantum mechanics. What Phil understood was that there was a mode of the system, which we today call a Goldstone mode, in which the system itself very slowly coherently rotates so that after some period of time, this entire configuration is rotated to here. And after some period of time, this configuration is rotated to there. And you wait a little longer and it's gone back to there. So that the system itself self averages, so to speak, in order to produce the proper ground state, which is a singlet, uh, rather than with any of these broken symmetry states. And in this paper, written in 52, um, Anderson estimates the time it would take for that to occur, and it was 10 years, uh, which is a number you don't often get in a quantum mechanical calculation. And so that was why experimentally one saw just any one of these, because you'd have to wait that long for the system to explore its entire configuration space. So quite a remarkable thing um, that he understands. Um, in fact, it turns out that it was only a year or two later that Jeffrey Goldstone working in, a, a na in, a, in particle physics um, came to the same sorts of conclusions and the phenomena of spontaneous symmetry breaking in the context of his problem. So um, this is a great success. And as I said, many, if you're, it, we're in the magnetism business, this is still kind of a small subset of the entire solid state physics um, community. But one of the people who was in that group um, was Ryogo Kubo who is right here. And he reads Anderson's paper and he's interested in the first part of the paper, they get in contact um, and they quickly realize that they have a great many interests in common. They also become friends their entire lives. And one thing that Kubo does is that he right away arranges for Anderson to be invited to an international conference of theoretical physics that was being held in Japan in 53. And this is very significant because this the purpose of this conference was to basically reintroduce the Japanese community, um, physics community to the world after World War II. Um, they were, you know, pariahs, and it was an attempt to show that they wanted to join back into the community. Um, and so most of the people who were invited were senior people who had significant international reputations. Anderson was known by nobody except Kubo. Um, but he invited him and then in fact asked him to stay for six months in his group. And Anderson got the agreement of Bell Labs to do that as long as somebody else paid for it. And the somebody else turned out to be the Fulbright Foundation uh, that Kubo managed to uh, get the funds from. The important thing about this from um, our point of view, it was at this conference where Anderson was brushing shoulders with a whole range of international superstar type physicists that he realized he could hold his own with those folks. You know, his country, if you look in the proceedings, he's very active asking questions and answering questions. And he realizes that he, he can compete with this group of people. Um, and that gives him great confidence for when he goes back to Bell and so that he can start setting the agenda actually at Bell Laboratories, even though he was still a rather young man. Uh, so he does that, he goes back to Bell Labs. And one of the characteristic behaviors of Anderson over his whole career is that he would spend a lot of time hanging around experimental laboratories. Um, again, this is the Van Vleck influence. He wants to be the first to see exciting experimental data 
uh, have the opportunity to try to understand it first. And so one, um, when he got back from Japan, he started hanging around the lab of George Fair, who uh, was a, a, a from Bratislava uh, uh, through Israel and finally to Berkeley, uh, where he does his thesis work in NMR. And when he is hired immediately after graduation to Bell, um, the problem he wants to work on is to study silicon. Now, at the time we're talking about here, um, most of the trans, all of the transistors uh, that were being made were being made of germanium, because that was during the war, the semiconductor which had been studied most heavily, and the first transistors were made of germanium. But it was understood that silicon was likely to be a, a good transistor material as well, but not a great deal was known about it. And so Bell Labs management was happy when Fair said he wanted to study this. And in particular, um, it's true of all semiconductors that the uh, pristine pure silicon crystal um, does not have any useful properties. But if you dope this crystal with impurity atoms, and as shown here, phosphorus, the blue atoms, are um, randomly distributed inside this silicon lattice. And it's only crystals of this kind that one can uh, have the type of exquisite control over the electrical properties that make semiconductors the important things that they are. And the reason for that is that every one of, in this case, every phosphorus atom adds one extra electron um, to the system. And so you get an extra electron in each of these blue sites. And what the quantum theory of this um, crystal would tell you is that that extra electron actually can tunnel from this site to that site to this site to that site. And it can just go from um, basically make a circuit around all of these blue atoms. And then that means that the wave function associated with this elect extra electron would be spread out over the entire crystal, right? And so that's in fact, what's typical of a perfect crystal. You have an atom which has a well and the extra electron has an energy level here. And you have all these atoms in a perfect crystal. These energy levels are all the same. And the solution to the Schrodinger uh, problem for this geometry is just a wave function, which looks like this. It extends from one side of the crystal to the other. And so the same sort of a thing was expected to happen um, for those blue uh, phosphorus atoms. The electron associated with each of those was supposed to spread out um, just as shown here. But when Fair did his experiments, what he found was that the wave functions associated with the extra electrons did not spread out and hop from phosphorus atoms to phosphorus atom to phosphorus atom. They all appeared to just hang around the original phosphorus atom as if they were just pure atomic electrons. You did not get what are called band wave functions. You got atomic wave functions. So this was a really a tremendous mystery because um, those electrons are supposed to be able to tunnel between the different blue sites, but they just didn't. Uh, this was quite a puzzle. And this was the problem that Phil set himself to trying to understand. And what he eventually realized that what was crucial was that the phosphorus atoms are not perfectly lined up one after the other like the silicon atoms are, but they are randomly arranged inside of the silicon crystal. And while people had solved the Schrodinger equation for a perfect crystal, and you got solutions like this, nobody actually knew how to solve the Schrodinger equation when the sites where the electrons could be were randomly arranged. And so that was a problem people guessed would have a solution like this, but didn't really know. Well, what Anderson did was he uh, built himself a small mathematical model, which had the essential features of this problem built into it. In other words, he said to himself, I can't possibly solve the Schrodinger equation for that problem, a silicon crystal with randomly isolated phosphorus um, atoms, forget it. Instead, I will make an extremely simple problem uh, and I won't even deal with the disorder. I won't even use spatial disorder. Instead, I'll, I'll have the wells uh, where the electrons are supposed to reside from atom to atom to atom uniformly separated like this, but the energy levels of when an electron happens to be in any one of these wells, that I will take to be a random variable. So he realizes that the type of randomness is not crucial as long as there's some kind of randomness. And this, in fact, this model 
when he solved the, this, he could solve quantum mechanically, and he was able to show that there are circumstances where you get this type of solution, but there are also circumstances where you get that kind of solution. And so this so-called disorder-induced localization was um, a really critical piece of uh, his first real breakthrough. It was a quantum mechanical solution of a problem no one had ever solved before. And in fact, it was widely disbelieved and mostly ignored at the time, uh, primarily because people didn't, couldn't imagine it could be true. Nevertheless, he wrote a paper about it, absence of diffusion in certain random lattices. This is this phenomena, which in fact later was um, recognized by the Nobel Committee. And the reason for that is that he had a champion. Like I said, not appreciated for over a decade, just like spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, he was ahead of his time. In the first two problems that he did, he was already a decade ahead of his colleagues. But Neville Mott, who he had met in Japan and was the chairman of the physics department at the University of Cambridge, um, became interested in what Anderson was doing and really became a champion um, and convinced a lot of people, both theorists and experimenters, that this was a deep question that required serious experimental work and serious theoretical work. And that's in fact, what eventually led to people realizing that Anderson was onto something important. Uh, the model making that I mentioned is really quite important. Um, like I said, he did not take the original problem of a silicon crystal with phosphorus atoms, the whole complicated business. Instead, he stripped away all of the elements which were inessential, leaving only the fact that you had electrons which hopped from site to site and disordered energy levels. And so all that was left of the original problem was a much simpler model that he could analyze um, and actually get some predictions from. And so that process, his process of model making, which I've represented here by using this set of lithographs from Picasso um, for a bull, uh, you may prefer this to this for aesthetic reasons. And Anderson was arguing that you should prefer this to this, even in general for any physics problem, because you need to understand um, what are the essentials to any particular physics problem? Focus on those and you'll understand really what's happening. And this became, again, a, um, a characteristic that he shows through his entire career, um, making these models where other people um, are wallowing around trying to mess with the original problem. So he's writing this up um, when the solid state physical world kind of gets rocked by uh, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer presenting um, their microscopic theory for superconductivity, the phenomena whereby some metals at very low temperature lose their electrical resistance. Uh, this got absolutely everybody jazzed, including Anderson. He was quite certain they were onto something um, and he wanted to contribute right away. So he actually put his localization paper down and didn't submit it and started working on these things. And I won't um, bore you with the details, except to say um, that this work catapulted Anderson to international prominence. You know, the magnetism work was well known in the magnetism community, but that's a small community. The localization stuff was appreciated by nobody. Um, and so it was this work in superconductivity that really got people excited. He solved a problem in gauge invariance in that problem. And he also studied uh, the so-called collective excitations in a superconductor, which has to do with a mode in which the electrons slosh back and forth at uh, a frequency, which is called the, the plasma frequency. And um, this got international attention, uh, got, his, got an invitation to Russia, where he in fact um, presented this work to um, Landau's famous seminar, and he met Landau for the first time. Um, another invitation it got to him, got to him, was to finally say yes to Mott, who had been trying to get him to come to Cambridge uh, for a sabbatical. And he finally agreed and spent the 61, 62 years there. And one of his requirements was that he be allowed to teach a graduate course. And that graduate course that he taught was his idea of what are the concepts in solids. This is a fascinating book. Um, it looks nothing like the books that had been written about solid state physics before that, um, which were all focused on phenomenology. There's no phenomenology in this book at all. It's all model Hamiltonians in which electrons and spins in various settings, um, he shows how you reproduce 
um, all of the, or many of the important things which are observed um, in solid state physics. From a historical point of view, this one year at Cambridge was really quite important because it generated two Nobel Prizes, although neither of them was for Anderson. Uh, one of them was for this gentleman, Brian Josephson, because he was a student in this class and he got excited when Anderson started talking about spontaneous symmetry breaking and wanted to apply it to a superconductor. Um, and whereas Anderson had been discussing it in the class in the context of the antiferromagnet. And it turned out that Anderson and Josephson spent hours and hours and hours after the class discussing these things. And ultimately, and, uh, Josephson writes a paper on this subject for which he eventually is awarded the 1973 Nobel Prize. And he credits Anderson um, for not only getting him started, but providing a great deal of important um, insight. So um, that's one Nobel Prize. The other one is that um, at Cambridge, it's uh, necessary to hang around the tea room every afternoon. And Anderson did that. And that's where he had his first real encounter with particle physicists, because there's very few of those at Bell Labs. Uh, there are a few, but only a few. And one of the things he hears about is that they're having a problem uh, with uh, some theories that at least one group of folks are trying to work on, uh, some gauge theories um, of certain elementary particles that they were thinking about, but the theories would not, did, the particles didn't have mass uh, and they needed some way to not wreck the symmetry of the models they were working with and yet have the particles be massive. And in a real incredible blinding flash of insight, Anderson realized that the work that he had done on superconductivity that had produced that sloshing mode, the non-zero frequency of that sloshing mode was the exact analog of the non-zero mass of the particles that the particle physicists were trying to get. And so he wrote this paper uh, and specifically published it in a place that the particle physicists would see making this suggestion. Um, roughly speaking, here's a graph of energy versus wave vector. And this branch is, an, is a branch of um, this, these collective excitations where there's, there's a finite frequency called omega p as a function of wave vector. Um, and Anderson had shown where that comes from in the superconductor. And one of the folks who read this paper soon thereafter was Peter Higgs, um, a young uh, particle physicist. And he realized that Anderson was right. The idea was right. All he had to do was take this paper, which was written in non-relativistic language and make it covariant, which is appropriate for any particle physics um, discussion. And in fact, he uh, demonstrated that you do get mass in just the way that Anderson had suggested. In addition, you get the so-called Higgs particle and um, the discovery of that, of course, in 2013 is what brought this whole business back to everybody's uh, attention uh, not too many years ago. Um, in his original paper, in the first paragraph, Higgs graciously credits Anderson for the idea. So there's that second um, Nobel Prize, if you like. Uh, the year ends. Anderson goes back to um, Bell Labs, starts hanging around yet another laboratory. Uh, it was the summer uh, when he went back and the theoretical offices in Murray Hill did not have air conditioners. They only had fans, but all the labs had air conditioners. So there was yet another reason to be hanging around the labs. And in this case, uh, it was the lab of Berndt Matthias, who was an expert in ferroelectricity and superconductivity. And he was also interested in what happens when you put magnetic atoms like iron and cobalt and uh, into non-magnetic metals like aluminum and silver. And um, the game there was to try to understand uh, how it affected the superconductivity, but you could also look at his data as a way to understand how um, magnets, bulk magnets form. And in fact, on the basis of understanding Matthias's and many conversations with Matthias, who by the way had no truck with theorists. Matthias was a seat of the pants experimenter who didn't see any real purpose uh, for theorists. Nevertheless, you know, he would um, entertain them. And so as a result, Phil said that his relationship with Matthias was sort of mostly love and some hate, but he did in fact produce one of his um, more famous papers on localized magnetic states in metals. And um, ultimately it was this work and the localization work together that were cited by the Nobel 
committee. Um, now, all during this time period, uh, Mott is trying to convince Anderson to come back permanently to Cambridge, uh, leave Bell Labs altogether. He doesn't succeed in, in doing that, but he does talk him into um, becoming a half-time professor at the University of Cambridge. So in other words, um, and Anderson agreed and Bell Labs agreed. And so he spent half a year teaching and researching at the University of Cambridge and the other half a year back at Bell Labs for quite a substantial number of years. Um, he helped create the theory of condensed matter group uh, that, that Andre come from, uh, your colleague comes from. And there are many interesting things that happened during this period. I wanna mention just one of them. Um, another thing that um, Anderson did this is the paper, A Poor Man's Derivation of Scaling Laws for the Condo Problem. The condo problem was related to the magnetic impurity problem that I mentioned. You put a magnetic atom into a non-magnetic host. What happens? Does the atom stay magnetic or does it lose its magnetism? That the a very closely related issue winds up being called the condo problem. It's a many electron problem, which really had stymied, and I actually counted, it's of the order of 100 different theoretical physicists wrote papers in the, in the late 60s uh, trying to understand what was going on. Was there a magnetic moment? Wasn't there? What was happening? Um, uh, Anderson working with Don Hammond at Bell Labs and Yuval, uh, Gideon Yuval, a PhD student, uh, essentially solved this problem by inventing what we would today call the renormalization group. In their original paper, um, it's a, a little bit hard to, to pick out, and so immediately thereafter, Phil wrote a single author paper. This is an incredibly beautiful paper where you'll see all of the elements of the Wilson renormalization group in here um, a couple of years before Wilson does his work. Um, by all accounts, the work was done independently um, and uh, exactly where the ideas came to Anderson, um, you know, he, he, it's, it's not clear from the written papers and um, I couldn't extract it from him or, or I should say, 40 years after the fact, he couldn't remember where the basic ideas came from. But um, in the paper, it's clear enough that he invented the renormalization group himself. So quite remarkable. Um, the, let me see what's, uh, yeah. So, you know, he, he ultimately decides to come back to Cambridge, come back to the United States from Cambridge. But at this time is where there's a break in his life and he starts looking beyond the physics world. He has, all during this time period, he's been taking this disparate subject of solid state physics and trying to show that it has an intellectual coherence to it. Um, and that it isn't a million different little, um, you know, schmutz physics, uh, that was a, a derisive term that Wolfgang Pauli applied to solid state physics, but it actually there were a handful of concepts that just had expressions in different ways. And you, if you were clever enough, you could understand that. And he was moving to that point of view. But he was also becoming interested in science policy. And he wrote a paper while he was at Cambridge uh, in 71 in a magazine, which is not widely read or wasn't um, in the United States at that time, called The New Scientist. Are the big machines necessary? And that's because there was talk at just this time, both in the United States and in England, to spend an enormous amount of money on a couple of large uh, accelerators. And so he writes in here, my doubts about the level of worldwide support for high energy physics have grown. I question the wisdom of shutting down smaller scientific projects to fund the construction of large particle accelerators. This article is an attack on the particle um, physicists and on the big machines and the money that's spent to build them. And he argues that they aren't, they have not justified the fraction of the total spending for phys of physics that goes to these machines. He claimed it was not matched by the achievements that the particle physicists were getting. And in particular, he um, doesn't accept the argument that they're doing the most fundamental kind of physics. Now in this article, he's attacking them on their own ground um, and he's not a trained particle physicist. He makes a few mistakes. Um, and in fact, this article sinks like a stone. Nobody responds to it at all. They don't need to. But he then realizes there's a better way to attack the particle physicist, which is what he was doing. And he publishes this article, which is a very famous article called More is Different. And here what he does is he doesn't attack 
what the particle physicists are doing, he instead attacks the philosophy, which is that they are doing the, the most fundamental kind of physics and that they deserve to be able to do these experiments, even if they're, even if they're expensive, because once you understand the most, what they would refer to as the most fundamental interactions in nature, you can then build up all the rest of science, all the rest of physics from the ground up. Um, and this is an argument that, for example, Steven Weinberg um, has championed for uh, all uh, since this time, and he continues to do that. And Anderson simply said, no, that's not right. In this paper, he writes, the behavior of large aggregates of elementary particles cannot be understood in terms of simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles. In other words, reductionism, the philosophical concept that you can reduce the behavior of complex things to some type of extrapolation of the properties of the individual particles and their interactions. Instead, he says, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear, the understanding of which requires research as fundamental in its nature as any. In other words, constructionism, you may be able to reduce but you can't construct. In other words, how these many particle systems behave must be consistent with all the laws of the smaller things, but you could never start with those laws and work your way up to, for example, how fluid turbulence works, or at least you couldn't possibly do it in a finite amount of time, and therefore it's uninteresting. The concept that he had in mind is called emergence, and that is the notion that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Uh, there's entirely new things which appear, which you would never appreciate otherwise. And he used the example of the rigidity of a solid um, as such a so-called emergent property. And this became important and his paper became widely celebrated because he actually gave a mechanism for emergence. And it was nothing more or less than spontaneously broken symmetry, which in the case of a solid, the rigidity of a solid, it's the translational symmetry of a gas, which is lost when that gas condenses into a crystal. And um, the details of that, I won't tarry with, but he then demonstrated that there were a great many um, other properties that fell into that category. Um, and in fact, um, let me uh, get to that sort of punchline um, in one moment. I just want to insert this one last little um, bit of history. And that is at a certain point in time, uh, Phil decided and his wife decided to come back to the United States. He swapped his half-time professorship at Cambridge for one at Princeton, but um, he wasn't idle. And in fact, one of his more famous pieces of work dates from that period. It again has to do with localization, but here one is involving renormalization group arguments to apply to the localization problem. And in particular, they found very interesting things in two dimensions that all quantum states happen to be localized. This particular piece of work uh, is known as the work of the gang of four, one, two, three, four, and they were playing off of um, a political situation in uh, communist China at the time. Uh, it's while he's, at, while he's at Princeton, by the way, 1977, that the Nobel Prize comes his way. And so here he is sharing the Nobel Prize with who? With John Van Vleck, his PhD mentor, and with Neville Mott, who had been so responsible for promoting his work around the world. Um, if you were in New Jersey, uh, near Murray Hill, um, the New Jersey edition of the Daily News showed this nice picture of uh, Anderson and his wife taking the call from Sweden. But you might you know, be forgiven if you thought they were actually a picture of the couple who got arrested on the sex ring charge, but that was um, not the case. Um, the Nobel Prize, of course, gives people wide latitude to work in other kinds of problems. I'll just say that in Phil's case, it got him involved in the creation of the Santa Fe Institute, which was a uh, really a think tank for research in problems with, with, that fell between the cracks of the normal disciplines. And in particular, he was very interested in instrumental in getting folks to say that the, the physics methodologies, which were used to study many body electrons, could be used to study all kinds of many body problems. And the economy was one of them. And the very first program at the Santa Fe Institute did was in fact, Anderson co-authors it with a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and they studied the economy as an evolving complex system.
He would have um, been very deeply associated with these folks for a long time if it weren't for the incredible discovery of high temperature superconductivity in December of 86, where, as you probably know, the transition temperatures for superconductors have been slowly going up, and then dramatically so with the discover of this discovery of this class of materials called cuprates, where the, um, show this incredibly high temperature of superconductivity. And this was perhaps the watershed of his career. He's born in 23. This is happening in 86. Um, Phil becomes the very first theoretician anywhere in the world to propose a mechanism for the superconductivity in this material. And not only that, he completely discards the bardeen cooper schrieffer paradigm. He says, instead, this is a many body problem. It has to do with spins, which are associated with the copper um, atoms here, uh, forming singlets with other um, copper spins, always up and down, up and down, up and down. And you have to superpose all of these various possible configurations. And he makes an entire theory of this. This problem, he is certain that he is about to win another Nobel Prize. It, in, it contains all of the elements of all of his previous work going back to the ferroelectrics, which are oxide materials like this, the many body problems, the magnetism, everything. Um, there's a famous meeting that some in the room may remember in March of 1987 called the Woodstock of Physics, where there was a, a, a session held that went through the entire night where uh, physicists after physicists were showing their basic results about this. Phil was the only person who was uh, only theorist who was at the press conference discussing his work. Um, Unfortunately, the, and he, he proposed a, a particular Hamiltonian for this, but unfortunately that Hamiltonian is a Hubbard, so-called Hubbard Hamiltonian. He nor he nor his collaborators could solve it with sufficient accuracy to convince others that he was right. And so he suffered a really a crushing disappointment when he wasn't able to convince people that he was right. And he really spent the rest of, rest of his life um, trying to do that and really not succeeding. So the punchline here is that um, Phil was a brilliant intuitionist who did more than any other person to transform the patchwork of ideas and techniques formerly called solid state physics into this deep, subtle, and intellectually coherent discipline known today as condensed matter physics. And he sort of put all that together in this book called Basic Notions of Condensed Matter Physics in 85, which is a difficult read, but, but quite rewarding. Now, there's many listening to me who probably everything I said was new. What they know about Phil is that he famously testified in 1993 uh, in connection with the superconducting supercollider. Um, uh, Steven Weinberg was a major advocate of that project. And Anderson was the very first physicist to go publicly negative about it. But you can see he'd already written about it in that New Scientist article. Here he was just taking that same argument and pushing it farther. There was one day where the two of them testified one right after the other. There was only one day that ever happened where they were present in the same room. Uh, here's part of Weinberg's verbatim testimony. If the super collider is killed this year, it's killed for good. And what is killed with it is high energy physics in America. And that may be the beginning of the killing of support for basic science in this country. Immediately thereafter, Anderson testifies and among the things he says, Two recent books have tried to justify the supposed fundamentality of particle physics. There's that argument again. The fact that the authors have time to write such books may tell you something about their field. They have nothing else to do. Well, both of these statements are hyperbolic without question, but it is the case that the Congress voted to cancel the SSC. There are um, a number of physicists to this day, perhaps some listening to me, who blame Anderson for that fact. Um, in fact, the Congress immediately did uh, its own investigation of the entire affair, came to the conclusion that what Anderson and Weinberg and all the physicists had to say was in fact irrelevant, um, that the cancellation had more to do with the um, endless increases in budget um, that kept occurring and also with significant management problems at the SSC. And that conclusion has been backed up in subsequent years by historians. There's a book called Tunnel Vision that I um, suggest for anyone's interested in that. So I'll conclude, I'll just say,
Um, you'll recall that way back in 53, 54, Anderson uh, visited Japan, he visited Ryogo Kubo. One of the things that he did as he was leaving was he bought a Japanese quince shown here, presented it to Kubo who planted it in his garden and it flowered every single year between 54 and 2019. In 2020, that quince withered and died and two weeks later, Anderson himself died. And if you are interested in any further details, Oxford at least tells me they'll be publishing this book in January. Thank you very much. Applaud on behalf of everybody. Um, <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, uh, let's have some questions. Uh, just unmute yourself and go ahead. So I, I had a question going back to this idea of Anderson's 1952 paper on symmetry breaking. And you had made this comment that he was sort of the first to really appreciate uh, the role of symmetry breaking. And so this immediately I thought of uh, Landau's theory of symmetry breaking phase transitions. And I believe that actually predated 1952, oh, yeah. right? That, so can yes. you comment more on what the unique aspects that Phil Anderson understood that Landau didn't? Um, sure. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, Landau certainly was the first to appreciate that aspect. I was sp specifically referring to what we today call spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, and in particular, this notion um, that there is a mode, today called the Goldstone mode, that um, restores the symmetry that's spontaneously broken. That's the aspect that was novel. You're absolutely okay. right about Landau. And, and, and Anderson is quite clear giving Landau um, all the credit in the world for that observation. So, so Andy, I, 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 have you read Solid State Insurrection? Sure. Okay. Because I think I, I, I think I like your take on the impact Anderson had may or may not have had on the on the SSC better than the take in that book. That book oh. spends way too much verbiage arguing that somehow. Anderson had this enormous influence in killing the SSC. And like, I kind of remember what was going on and I always thought it was kind of overblown. So I'm glad to hear that your, your, your observation. Yeah, now, and that's, that's not my, I mean, that's not, I should say it's not my judgment. Um, this, this book, it's, it's Lillian Hodgson and uh, Vicki Deitch and, um, and, and Reardon, um, this book, Tunnel Vision. But it's also interesting to find this congressional report that, that came to that same conclusion. The thing was that Anderson was, number one, extremely vocal about it. Um, and he was also cutting, you know, he, he would, he, he didn't do it as graciously, shall we say, as one might have. Um, and that made him a, a target. As a matter of fact, um, the anniversary of the whole SSC, let's see, which one would it have been, uh, came up recently and, and Physics Today did a little number on it. And they, and they mentioned Anderson as sort of leading, leading the charge. And he, thin-skinned as he is about many things, complains, he says, I'm not the only one, you know, who was objecting to the SSC at the time. And it's true, he wasn't, but he was the first and he was the loudest and he was the most obnoxious about it. And so that, that attracts attention. <laughs> Maybe, uh, Andrew, I wanted to ask you a good question. Uh, so, yeah. so you mentioned Anderson's... Um, started working on superconductivity shortly after, after the BCS paper. Can yes. You tell us about, was Anderson himself in interviews with you or was it known historically? Was he interacted with, with either of the trio, Bardeen, Cooper and Schriffer and yeah. you know, was the mutual interactions? Right, so, so one has to remember that, that um, I didn't put his picture up there, but when Anderson went to Bell Labs, Bardeen was there um, and, um, but he had just fallen out with well, so Shockley, of course, the, the Nobel Prize for the Transistor went to Shockley, Bardeen, and Brittain. But in fact, it was invented by Bardeen and Brittain. Shockley was their boss. Um, and he then proceeded to co-opt them in many ways. And they both got pissed off and left, and left the field. And so Bardeen went and started working on superconductivity while at Bell Labs. But nobody else at Bell Labs cared about it at the time. Um, and so 
uh, Anderson did not treat Bardeen as a mentor because he wasn't interested in superconductivity at the time. And so, but he, they were friendly. And so he knew him. Um, so after Bardeen leaves and goes to the University of Illinois and does his work with Schrieffer and um, Cooper, they send a preprint back to Bell Labs. And that preprint gets everybody's attention. Um, but what really did it was is that Bardeen came and gave a colloquium at Princeton. Um, and so, um, you know, a bunch of the theorists, you know, jumped in a car and went, drove to Princeton and listened to Bardeen. And that excited all of them because they were absolutely convinced that he must somehow be right. And this problem with gauge invariance, surely there must be, or Anderson's attitude was, this is a technical detail. It cannot be a wrong theory just because it's gauge invariant. And he then proceeded to demonstrate that that was the case. Well, if there are no further questions to um, Andrew, uh, I'd like to ask all of you who want to stay over and chat informally, but first let us all thank uh, Andrew.